What attracted me to this project was obviously an incredible opportunity to work with Jane, who I've loved uh, her work since I think probably I very first discovered that film was a thing as a teenager. So just an incredible honor to work with her. And as well, it was an undoubtedly incredible script um, that from the very first read was just captivating and yeah, incredibly exciting. Um, yes, needless to say, it didn't require much thought as to whether I'd do this project or not. It was, yeah, incredibly exciting from the get-go. I think what was maybe unique about this project is um, when Jane first called me about it, she mentioned she wanted to do a really long pre-production. Um, so I was involved about a year before we started shooting. And uh, so we started collaborating I guess a long time before we ever rolled camera, we visited locations all over New Zealand, spent hours and hours together talking about the script and big picture stuff, tiny little details, everything from which location we were going to choose down to what kind of buttons should be on a shirt or what kind of tablecloths we should have. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, the collaboration was big, picture stuff, tiny details, and um, we're both huge fans of pre-production. So we did probably about three or four weeks intensive one-on-one -on -one storyboarding um, and shot listing in a little um, kind of cabin in the South Island of New Zealand, which was a very idyllic kind of place to do pre-production and really shut ourselves off from the rest of the world to just focus on this really important prep before the mad reality of shooting or, or even like proper pre-production began. So yeah, we both really wanted to have a, a super strong plan going in. Um, and yeah, I think you can see that, I hope in the film, in all those decisions that were made, yeah, kind of months and months and months before we were ever standing um, in a set or with the actors or, yeah, and then on set, um, Jane is kind of amazing in that she has this plan that we've come up with. And then right up to the last moment, she's up for changing anything that her gut instinct says isn't working. So whether it's something you've prepared and invested a lot of time in, when the shots lined up and after one take, it's still like not working. It's there's no reason to change everything or, um, and that was also um, really incredible to be part of someone, working with someone that just up to the very last moment doesn't stop trying to make it better or more interesting, more unique, more real. I wasn't familiar with the novel uh, before, Jane called me about the film, but the first thing she said was, I read this book and I want to make it into a movie and do you want to read it? And of course I grabbed the novel, devoured it. I think as soon as I finished it, I pretty much started to read it again because it's just a world you want to be in. The voices are amazing. And I think my first impressions of it was just how deeply in the world you can fall and also that the way it's written, which we wanted to reflect in the film, is that you really do transition quite gently and flawlessly between characters, kind of before you know it, you're in a scene with someone and then suddenly you've transitioned to someone else's point of view. And um, the book does that really flawlessly and kind of intertwines all these past, present kind of things. Um, in a way where you don't necessarily realize where those transition points are. So yeah, it's, it was an amazing, um, yeah, an amazing blueprint to, to start with. Yeah, I would definitely recommend anyone, maybe not before seeing the film, but if you haven't, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful book. The visual language for me of a film is 
it's the culmination of the visual language of each scene really. Um, and that starts at the script level, reading the script over and over, talking with Jane about um, what each scene's function needs to be and what, it, what the experience for a viewer should be watching it emotionally and then what information is essential by the end of that scene. And that probably sounds quite a cold way of kind of dissecting it. But for me, that's usually the start point, like how the visuals are gonna serve the story. And then we start basically deciding where does the camera need to be in each moment to capture, uh, I guess it's like, what's the information, what's the emotion, and then transport yourself to the role of the viewer audience um, and what's their experience going to be capturing this bit of information with this emotion and this information, this emotion over the whole length of the film. Um, so that's kind of the start point. And then I guess sometimes as well um, on a project, and this one was, was true of this as well, you'll come up with some kind of, I guess, goals or rules that you think would be interesting. Um, and on this one, it was kind of, the script was so great and so dense already um, that there was really no reason to try to need to like jazz it up or kind of, there was no, uh, the script didn't need extra in a way. Um, and that's not to say we didn't think about making it beautiful, but uh, Jane kept saying this word unadorned which is like, doesn't need extra icing, doesn't need extra jewelry to, um, to make it exciting. It's already fundamentally dramatic, tense, beautiful. Um, and so that was kind of our rule to make sure we're never trying to do a cool shot, I guess. Um, yeah, and then we wanted elegance and we wanted to, obviously set the time, set the time of day, time of year, the place, and then just remember what's the most important thing, which is the faces and the actors. Um, yeah, so that's, I guess, how we came up with the visual style. We, what we did also talk a lot about is color palette. Um, that was a huge point of conversation, myself, Jane, Grant, Major, the production designer, Kirsty, Cameron, the wardrobe um, designer. That was probably the biggest ongoing conversation, like how we were going to unify all these departments and how we were going to unify New Zealand to make sure it felt enough like Montana um, and how colour was part of that. Um, so, yeah, that were kind of our big conversation points. In terms of references for The Power of the Dog, I think our first starting point was really the book. Um, and when you read it, you really do have such a complete image of a place down to the textures and the colors and the tone and all of that. So that was definitely our first point of reference. Um, and then we kind of looked to paintings and, and photographs. Um, Andrew Wyeth was a big um, influence in the color palette and the minimalism, um, the landscape, people in landscapes and people, interiors, windows, um, and a kind of dusty color palette, I guess you could call it. Um, and then um, Lucian Freud was also another painter that we looked at a lot um, in a similar, similar kind of restrained color palette. And uh, his work is more about kind of, I guess you could say like imperfect, but beautiful faces and emotion. And yeah, I guess like an imperfect kind of masculinity maybe and vulnerability. Um, so yeah, we, we didn't actually watch that many films. Um, I think we wanted to more be influenced by the, there's just so many amazing, um, photographs from that time as well in that place where you look at one photograph and it's um yeah it's something you want to 
aspire to recreate because you can feel the place, feel the tone, feel characters that feel so real. I think that was our real point of aspiration to look at a photo from the time and say, how can we make a, how can we get that person that we saw in that photo be in a movie? What is it going to take? What are the details? What are the big picture stuff? Yeah, that was, that's, uh, that's probably where most of our references came from. When you look at or think about the power of the dog, definitely some Western movie um, vibes come to mind instantly when you, I mean, it's got the location, it's got cowboys, it's got cut, it's got cattle, it's got little outposts and ranches and all the, I guess, things that one would usually associate with a Western. Um, and, uh, but I guess for us in many ways, the film um, is quite different from a Western in that, uh, for me, when I think about Westerns, I think about, um, I guess, the kind of dramatic, big dramatic tension that culminates in a big show of violence or kind of force in a very big way um, and and maybe a threat coming from the outside. Whereas this film is really about kind of the threat being in the house in like coming from within the property, within the house. And, and for us, what was most interesting was that you don't need big physical violence to control or intimidate someone and that psychological violence is probably the most powerful thing that humans do to each other that uh, the way someone closes a door or walks up stairs or puts their plate down can be just as terrifying as pulling a gun on someone to the point where uh, the culmination of those things and a couple of tiny little words can make someone not want to come out of their bedroom or not want to want to sneak around and not get seen. Um, yeah, I guess um, there were some things we drew from classical Westerns, um, which I would say would be um, shooting the landscape from the long lens. Um, it's something I really actually fell in love with in that location. It's I mean, the distances are so vast, you can really literally go on as long a lens as you can possibly find because you can drive for kilometers and still look at the house or the mountains or a road. Um, so, uh, yeah, and there are also some sequences um, of kind of traveling place to place where the, um, the Burbanks go to beach for the first time or Peter goes on a mission. Um, where we had to shoot, I guess, someone or a group of people on horseback going from one place to another. So for us, that's probably where we drew the most on, on that to decide here's a sequence where we have to tell someone going from one place to another, they're gonna be on horseback. That's been definitely explored in cinema history <laughs> ad nauseum. Should we counter it? Should we reference it? Should we do our own thing? And um, probably the only film I really looked at in detail for that was something like Lawrence of Arabia, actually, that is, um, yeah, a big, a long journey through an epic landscape. And then thinking about, for us, maybe that sequence, how long is it going to be? Um, and Jane and I talked a lot about say, um, designing shots that were um, designed for how long that they were predicted to be lasting in the edit. So is this a shot that needs to tell its information in five seconds or is it gonna hold for one minute? Um, or will this be a, a sequence that requires four shots, two shots, one shot, when you're telling distance and that kind of, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and I guess the other thing for us, which is Western-y was this kind of isolation. Um, 
for me, when I think of Westerns as well, there's a sense of the landscape and the environment being hostile and a difficult place to live. Um, but actually in this story, um, it's a family that's doing pretty well off the land. Life's kind of hard, I guess, because it's the 1920s and it's harder than we imagine it to be. But for this particular family, life's pretty much as good as it could be. Um, so for us, it wasn't about the landscape being hostile, but building a sense of isolation um, and how far it is from place to place. Um, with the main purpose really of setting up for by the time that Rose gets to the Burbank Ranch, that you really deeply know emotionally that this is a place where she's not going to be able to get away from in a hurry um, and that no one's coming to help you. There's no witnesses everywhere. Is multiple days ride or drive away and once she arrives, that sense of isolation is hopefully really palpable and adds to the emotional impact of what happens to her. Um, and yeah, I think that for us was, in terms of the landscape, the most important thing to show, not just the beauty, but the isolation, and not just for the sake of isolation, but for the emotional resonance for Rose, what that would mean for Rose and for Peter being so far from anyone that could help them that it was um, maybe you could say for Peter, he was, or for Rose, if help was coming, it was gonna to have to come from one of them. We were really blessed to have an amazing cast on Power of the Dog. Um, just incredibly talented and experienced actors who really transformed themselves into these roles. Um, just a real pleasure to watch and work with. As I mentioned, we'd done, Jane and I had done such a long prep and we'd really kind of shot listed the entire film. Um, and the thing with shot listing is also you have to basically pre-imagine what the choreography and the blocking is going to be ever seen in order to come up with the imagined shots that are going to tell that sequence. So I guess as much as you imagine that there's a lot of kind of collaboration in terms of the blocking and choreography, for us actually it was important that a lot of that work we'd done already. Um, and then once the blocking is fairly determined, the actors can really play with and have time with Jane to take the scene somewhere emotionally knowing that you come in here, you get to here. And then um, within that structure that's got a, not necessarily set in stone or predetermined if it doesn't end up working, but we had a kind of a guide that was there, um, which would allow um, plenty of scope to play and, and allow the time that we weren't spending trying to figure out what if someone came to here, what if someone moved to there, we could have that quite, um, already have a bit of an idea with shots planned. Um, and that allows for all the time on set not, not to be thinking about where the camera's gonna be or where the actors are gonna be, but to get into the um, emotional truth of the scene and have time to do actual takes um, with the actors. And I guess the other thing of being in such an enormous environment and also a, the set itself in studio was also huge, just infinite possible angles um, that we, we wanted to make sure that with our prep time, Jane and I had explored every possible angle on this property, every possible angle in studio. So um, on the day uh, we weren't hunting around, fishing around, trying to find something better because we knew that that angle was the best, whether it was walking half an hour down the valley to see if the house looked any better from that angle or driving up to the top of a hill with a super long lens seeing would here be better, going back to places, spending hours and hours in the studio, considering the scene from every angle, um, just so you can know when you get to a scene 
we know these angles are going to be great for this. And if they're not, we know a bunch of other ones that, that might stand in for them or we find an incredible angle. We know this angle, we've got to have this angle in the film, which, which scene could it work for? Um, so yeah, that, that said, obviously working with actors, I love watching what they do and incredible faces to light and to frame. So there's a huge amount of collaboration that goes on on set, obviously. Yeah, also that kind of semi-invisible work that happens before it to make sure that you've done the prep to have the time when everyone's there and time is really of the essence that they're going to have time with Jane to get the scene where they all want it to go and, and have options um, without getting bogged down in trying to find a good angle. Obviously working in that location was really um, challenging mainly. I mean, you're just so exposed to the elements, which um, I don't know if this is the same for everyone, but for me, I do struggle to have like creative thoughts when you're being smashed by the wind or <laughs> buffeted by the rain or it's so sunny, you can't even think in New Zealand so bright, the sun is wildly strong. Um, so yeah, that was also why we really knew we had to do all the prep kind of in a calm, civilized environment with a cup of tea and a nice table, knowing that we we're going to be out there, um, just battling sometimes even to, I mean, some of the days were so windy. Um, yeah, it was like, you almost couldn't stand still. <laughs> um, and then the other challenge um, I think from the get-go for me was that we were going to be shooting on location and then we were going to come back to Auckland and shoot in the studio um, and Grant built, built us an amazing beautiful set um, but it was something really important to Jane and to me that once you stepped inside that you didn't feel like oh now we're in the studio um, or and, and part of that was knowing was making sure that we had these huge windows um, in the in the house um, so that was both exciting and also slightly um, anxiety inducing because ultimately as a cinematographer that that how to achieve that is going to fall to you so um, uh, the solution we came up with I was really happy with we had a very lo-fi approach which was to print backdrops um, which probably like the size of a kind of small billboard um, of photos from the locations. Um, and then we had them outside the window in the studio. Um, they weren't super fancy, they were super basic, not a translight or anything. Um, but what that allowed us to do was never have to pull the curtains or draw the blinds to not see the outside world. And also um, knowing that uh, we didn't also have um, blue screen kind of coming into the set or for the actors to be able to stand in the set and feel like there's the place out there that's super satisfying to do a shot and know it's done, not that it's done except for what we see out the windows, which could be 30% of the frame. Um, and yeah, the set was made up um, of these beautiful timber panel, wood panel walls, which have a beautiful sheen on them, um, which means that all those reflections are also the correct reflections versus um, blue or green screen, which is really devastating. It's a DP, super geeky kind of first world problem, but <laughs> when the blue or green screen color comes into your set, it's um, a real, uh, geek nightmare <laughs> so we avoided that one um, but yeah that was that was a challenge that I think we really turned into an asset because it, it meant we could um, see out every window and also means again like emotionally for Rose when she starts to go on a bit of a downward spiral and she spends a lot of time in her bedroom upstairs starts to draw the blinds close the curtains not want to um, not want to know about the outside world that we've had that contrast of downstairs is big open windows and then up in Rose's little cave is a kind of um, cocoon 
that she's trying to make for herself. Um, yeah, and then favorite moments. Um, I mean, it's just an incredible, uh, sometimes I'm struck by like what a crazy feat of human endeavor filmmaking is. Um, and I feel so lucky to be in you know, the moment where you kind of put your eye on the eyepiece and you see, you really see years of work of hundreds of people in this little kind of rectangle, um, tiny little mini people. And so many times you think back, like years ago, someone, you know, Jane came on this project and the script and then all the hundreds of people that made it possible to get everything here again, like down to every button. And yeah, it's a real kind of surreal moment when you feel yourself looking through, be one of the first people to see all that and then see even the things that happen and change up to three seconds before we're rolling, someone running in and swapping out a prop or actor changing a performance or tweaking a light and everything. Yeah, it's every one of those big moments where everything's just there and it's such a, it feels like such a joy to be yeah, the first person to see it um, and see see the actors doing beautiful work and seeing, yeah, just crazy human kind of <laughs> thing that we do. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that feeling. And, and um, yeah, I'm, certainly wasn't lost on me on this film, the scale of what we were trying to achieve, even building a house in the middle of nowhere and, snow and rain and wind and just to to get this little kind of postage stamp size little image um which is ultimately going to end up on a huge screen yeah it's a real buzz and a real joy to to do that when jane and i started first thinking about um making this film the I think something we both have in common is a real focus on the viewer. I mean, it sounds kind of obvious, but it can be easy to forget when you're making a film that someone's going to watch this in a series of images um, and they're not going to know all the things that you know. Um, they're not going to have read the script or know all the effort that went into anything or understand the architecture that you're kind of designing. And so for us, we're very focused on um, what an audience is going to take away at the end, what's the whole film's kind of, um, I guess like any film, but particularly this film, it felt like it's it's heading to a certain emotional point that we hope that people will feel um, at the end. And then we really wanted, I guess, the film to be a like a strongly retrospective experience as well, that you would experience the film as you're watching it and then feel something towards the very end quite strong hopefully and then in the aftermath be it the next few hours or even days later maybe hopefully you're thinking about it still remembering things and thinking back to your experience of watching it and even a film hopefully that you could watch multiple times and have a different viewing experience the first time and the second time and maybe times after that to see maybe some of the things, some of the kind of micro warning signs that maybe you missed or a line or um, a piece of information that was hidden deeply. Um, so yeah, I think if, if there's something to take away from it, I think it would be the, the hope that it's something that sits with you, that feeling and, and to think back. Um, yeah, maybe even watch it a second time and see if it, see how it's different. Um, and to think about some of the assumptions you had about certain characters at the beginning of the film and how they change um, throughout. Um, yeah, I think that's that's probably the, um, the, the thing I'd most hope for someone watching the film.